Hello, everyone. Welcome to KPMG's podcast covering the recently issued Accounting Standards Update 2014-02, Accounting for Goodwill, a Consensus of the Private Company Council. This ASU was recently issued by the FASB and provides an alternative for accounting for goodwill subsequent to a business acquisition for private companies. My name is Haley Kreps and I'm a Senior Manager in KPMG's Department of Professional Practice. This podcast was recorded on February 17, 2014, and for the next few minutes, I'll highlight some of the key considerations of the goodwill alternative for private companies. The FASB issued the final standard in January 2014, and it should be applied prospectively to goodwill existing as of the beginning of the period of adoption and new goodwill recognized in annual periods beginning after December 15, 2014, and interim periods within annual periods beginning after December 15, 2015. Early application is permitted. If a private company hasn't issued its 2013 financial statements, or those financial statements are not yet available for issuance, it could apply the standard to its 2013 financial statements. The standard is applicable to private companies only, and the board deferred a decision on its applicability to not-for-profit entities to a later date. The Private Company Council added this issue to its agenda through feedback it had received from both users of private company financial statements and preparers of those financial statements, indicating that they disregard goodwill and goodwill impairment losses. Preparers also raised concern over the recurring cost and complexity of the current goodwill impairment test. Under the alternative, a private company could elect to amortize goodwill acquired in a business combination on a straight-line basis not to exceed 10 years. If a period shorter than 10 years is deemed to be more appropriate, the company may use that period. The PCC had decided that the 10-year period would reduce complexity from the original exposure draft in which it had indicated that the useful life would correspond with the primary asset acquired in a business combination. While they acknowledged that the 10-year period was arbitrary, they did state that generally one would expect a significant portion of the assets and liabilities acquired in a business combination involving private companies would be fully used up or satisfied by the 10th year. Since it is difficult to predict the useful life of goodwill, they felt the use of an arbitrary period was the most practical solution for private companies. The standard does allow companies to look at whether or not a short or useful life could be supported based on an entity's specific facts and circumstances. For example, if an entity entered into a business combination solely to acquire a specific asset of the acquired entity, it may be appropriate to amortize the goodwill that resulted from that acquisition over the life of that specific asset if that specific life was shorter than 10 years. The PCC discussed the option of a useful life of zero or an immediate write-off of goodwill, but determined that would not be appropriate when applying the alternative. An entity that elects the accounting alternative is required to make an accounting policy election to either test goodwill for impairment at the entity level or the reporting unit level. Also under the alternative, a private company would only test goodwill for impairment when a triggering event is identified that indicates that the carrying amount of either the entity or the reporting unit, depending on the policy election made, may exceed the fair value of that entity or reporting unit. This differs from current U.S. GAAP, which requires goodwill to be tested for impairment, either on an annual basis or when certain conditions exist. To simplify the impairment test, a private company would apply a one-step method of calculating goodwill impairment loss as compared to the two-step impairment test that previously required for all entities. An impairment loss would be the excess of the carrying amount of the entity or the reporting unit over its fair value. Now we have a short example to demonstrate the application of this standard. In this example, ABC Company acquires DEF Company on January 1, 2012 and recognizes $1 million of goodwill upon the acquisition. ABC acquired DEF primarily for its proprietary technology, which has a remaining useful life upon adoption of the new standard of seven years. How would ABC Company account for the goodwill going forward if they elect the accounting alternative in ASU 2014-02? Under the new guidance, ABC could elect to amortize the existing goodwill over seven years as the primary purpose for the acquisition was the proprietary technology, if that shorter period is determined to be more appropriate. If that shorter period is not deemed to be more appropriate, ABC would amortize goodwill over a 10-year period. The second question is when would ABC test for impairment? Since the new guidance allows the company to test only if an event occurs that indicates the fair value of the entity, 
due to the policy election made upon adoption by ABC, may be below its carrying value, no impairment test would be conducted until the triggering event noted in 2015. This would be the point at which management determined it is no longer more likely than not that its fair value exceeds its carrying value. And what would the results of this impairment test be? In this case, an impairment charge of $200,000 would be recognized, which is the amount by which the carrying amount of ABC exceeds its fair value. As of December 31, 2015, in the example, the remaining goodwill balance would be $514,000. This is net of two years of amortization of $143,000 per year and the $200,000 impairment charge recognized in 2015. As part of the Private Company Council project, the Board also instructed the staff to research alternatives to the subsequent accounting for goodwill for public business entities and not-for-profits. The FASB met on February 12, 2014, to discuss potential alternatives to the current accounting treatment for the subsequent measurement of goodwill. The staff presented the following alternatives. Adopt the PCC model not for all entities. Amortize goodwill over its expected useful life not to exceed a specified number of years with impairment tests. Direct write-off of goodwill or a simplified impairment test without amortization. While the board deliberated the potential alternatives and raised several additional questions, they elected to defer any decisions at this time. There are several projects that indirectly impact, or could be impacted by, a change to the current model for evaluating goodwill subsequent to an acquisition, including the PCC's current project on accounting for identifiable intangible assets in a business combination, and the IASB's post-implementation review on IFRS 3 business combinations. The board believes that the developments in these projects could influence their thinking on the Goodwill project. In addition to monitoring the PCC and IASB projects, the board instructed the staff to perform additional research primarily around the options presented for writing off Goodwill and a simplified impairment approach. That concludes KPMG's podcast on the private company alternative for accounting for Goodwill in ASU 2014-02. You can find more information on the Financial Reporting Network, including our defining issues on new private company guidance. Thank you for listening.